Our next speaker this morning is Mitchell Higashi, who is the chief economist of GE Healthcare. Perhaps the most interesting uh, and also potentially provocative use of big data analysis is in the field of healthcare. On the one hand, it could finally bend the cost curve to use the jargon of healthcare economists that are driving up healthcare costs in the states, uh, provide more targeted uh, and efficient healthcare, improve preventative medicine, but of course it raises some questions about the privacy of our data. And on that note, I will ask Mitchell to join us on stage, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Well, thank you. It is a huge honor to be here at MTech. Uh, I just want to take a few moments to describe to you how GE connects with the big data discussion. Okay, so GE makes machines, jet engines, CT scanners, MRI scanners, uh, and these machines are becoming intelligent data factories. Okay, so we are equipping our machines with advanced sensors, uh, enabling our machines to uh, talk to software, uh, building a layer of advanced analytics on top of all this data. And all this work is being led by our new GE Software Center in San Ramon, California. And they're working on this idea of the industrial internet. Okay, so this would be a global open network that uh, connects people plus data plus machines. And for us, it's really all about designing and optimizing big industrial networks and systems, okay? So the idea is that we could uh, boost productivity, boost performance for uh, industries on a grand scale, and uh, you know that's the way we connect into the big data discussion. This talk is more of a big data policy uh, talk, but I wanted to set that stage. Okay, so uh, we get to uh, observe and participate these fascinating policy discussions around the world. A lot of this is happening in developing countries, uh, where they are trying to design and build cutting edge healthcare systems. Um, they want to make use of the data, and they have these basic questions, you know, such as where do we build the next hospital, how do we equip it, how can we be assured that we're going to improve against population health metrics, okay? And so there's enormous potential to use big data. I think we would all agree that uh, it, this data is fast, fluid, becoming widely prevalent. Uh, but I also want to suggest to you that, you know, the way we make decisions that govern the design of society, that policy process is behind uh, the data. And why is that? Well, for many good reasons, policy is slow, complex, and ambiguous, right? It takes a long time to implement a new healthcare policy. Uh, there's many moving parts underneath it, such as technology and the economy, and it's ambiguous. Right? People have different goals for society. People have different ways of measuring forward progress. And so I am certainly not here to say that um, big data will solve all of our problems in the policy space. But I think there's a real opportunity here for us to just get better in the design phase, okay? So if the policymakers uh, had better access to big data and could get better, richer insights, and we could make that whole process more participatory on the front end, then you know, we think uh, we could be coming to the table with more robust policies uh, at that implementation stage. Okay, so one way that we would propose that this would be done is through a combination of maps, models, and games. Okay, so maps, uh, for the purpose of this talk, visual displays of quantitative information, uh, models, right, simulation methods to project future consequences of problems, and then games, just making it fun and interesting to work on policy problems, okay? Many people in this room are advancing all of these three fields, uh, and what we're doing is we're combining and applying these different techniques to uh, real world problems. Okay, so for example, what if we could do this? Okay, uh, this is where it got fun. We brought in uh, our friends from MadPow. So MadPow is a game design firm here in the Boston area, and we got to work. We started sketching out ideas. So we said, okay, here you have uh, a map of India, and you have the state of Karnataka. Okay, so it's pretty obvious here. You have these big dark circles, right? And the big dark circles can equal a population health problem. Uh, but the map would need to be very interactive and capable of complexity. So what you see here on the front end, you know, uh, useful, helpful, maybe not groundbreaking, but 
You need to be able to go deep right down to the district level, like a zip code level, and see what's happening at an individual hospital and how that hospital is configured. And you would need to be able to pull back up and overlay different views. Okay, overlay the healthcare infrastructure, the energy grid, uh, access to clean water, all of this stuff matters. Uh, that's the map side of it, okay? Then, if you look at the bottom here, you needed to be able to press play. And uh, play, that's the model, right? So over a 10 to 20 year period, how would this problem manifest itself? How would simultaneous population health problems manifest themselves, put strain on the existing healthcare system, create bottlenecks, right? That's the model portion. And then finally is the game. So the right hand column, you know, that's an example of three health metrics. There are many health metrics you could choose from, or economic metrics. And the object of the game is drag and drop hospitals and improve your score. Now, every time you drag and drop a hospital, you're adding cost, right? You're adding cost to the system, but you're also improving on these metrics. And we wanted to make it easy for people to see different scenarios, different snapshots and say, well, what is the right trade-off? How do I optimize the available budget, okay? So, once we got the concept sort of laid out and some general agreement around this, then comes the operating system, right? So how are we going to run this off of the data that's available? Um, this is where we reached out to our friends at Argonne Labs. So Argonne National Labs, the uh, research arm of the U.S. Department of Energy, working on fascinating stuff in the energy space. Okay, so for example, uh, one day, uh, five million people on the East Coast that's many of you here, uh, are going to get into your electric cars and drive home from work, and then you're all gonna plug your electric cars into the grid at the same time, right? So what does that do to the peak load capacity? What does that do to the spot price of energy? Potential problem, right? So you use modeling to project those consequences. Uh, we had been exploring agent-based modeling, and they were really taking it to the next level, right? So with advances in uh, computing storage power, uh, they were synthesizing large, uh, indeed millions of people and simulating their behavior, okay? So we asked them to help us uh, on a healthcare problem of this nature. So the idea is, uh, in a world of unstructured big data, right, one uh, potential solution is we go all the way to the extreme of highly structured. Okay, so structured that we're essentially recreating digital people. And once your unit of measurement is a person, Right? Once you have essentially recreated a person, you can now build into uh, this person code. Right? So uh, specific health behaviors, risks for many diseases, and uh, you can also tag them to a virtual location on a map. Okay? Um, here's a screenshot of the actual uh, running system. This is a working system now. So what you're looking at uh, is the state of Andhra Pradesh in India. Okay? So, um, we took three different data sources, uh, merged them together, coded, created our populations. Uh, to our knowledge, this is the first digital map and model that is uh, completely interactive, and it gives you a vis visual. This shot is a high-level visual of population health. Okay, So whenever uh, someone plays this game, they need to be reminded of two things. Okay, So uh, number one, they're not just playing a game on their laptop. Right? They're sending a query to a server. So when you drag and drop a hospital on this screen, you send a query to the cloud, uh, they ru it runs a simulation, sends back the projection of what the new future is going to look like, and then uh, populates your screen. That's point one. Point two, uh, people need to be reminded they are no longer working with real big data. Right? This is 80 million pieces of code living out their lives in the cloud, right? Uh, this is the parallel uh, cloud state of Andhra Pradesh that sits over top of the real state, okay? Uh, so first time I presented this, uh, you know, working prototype publicly, I was prepared for some data questions. So, um, you know, where did you get the data? How did you code the data? Uh, first question I ever got was from a primary care physician. And he said, uh, hey, uh, great stuff, glad you're working on this for uh, decision makers. Um, you know, I'm a primary care doc, uh, I'm responsible for about 400 patients in my catchment area. I see a lot of um, inefficiencies and gaps in care, so how about I use a system like this, and then I could redesign a 
care delivery for my catchment area, and then I could share my results with the policymakers. Okay? So he saw something that we could not see the entire time that we were working on this. Uh, and namely, if you make it easier for policymakers to access and work with big data, well, you're actually making it easier for everyone to participate in the policy process. Okay? Uh, so that leaves me with my uh, last slide and a, a question and a thought that I would offer to you. Um, how do we define winning in the world of big data games? So that physician had a totally different definition of winning that I had never uh, considered. And as more and more people uh, solve problems with these big data games, uh, I would offer to you that more and more definitions of winning will emerge, and it'll begin to stress uh, our previous paradigms right, about how policy is formed. Uh, let me just quickly break this question down for you. First of all, who is the we in We Are Winning? Um, all of you can uh, enter these games, but you need to decide, will I design a future system where everybody benefits a little bit, or a few people benefit a lot? Okay, that's the first question. Uh, secondly is define, right? Define dictates design. The metrics you choose to measure forward progress uh, is going to govern the kind of system that you set up. And then lastly, uh, winning. Uh, and this is where I think big data gets personal. Uh, Jason invited us to talk about how we want to use technology going forward. We all have different definitions of winning, right? And uh, it's my hope that uh, big data games like this could perhaps introduce a new spirit, uh, a new spirit of creativity, of collaboration. Maybe we would see some crowdsourcing happen in the policy space. And uh, it's an idea and a hope of mine that um, perhaps uh, we could all get to bigger and bolder definitions of winning than we previously thought possible. So again, thank you very much for your time. And it's a pleasure to be here. Mitch, let's chat for a few seconds sure. before I, I bring you back up. Let's talk about this concept of designing a, a system. And I'll say a few things where you grab a, a bit of water. Um, so in the aggregate, mm -hmm. as an economist, how predictable are human beings' healthcare choices? Yeah, excellent question. You know, many, um, first of all, a lot more is known about behaviors than we realize, and I think mm -hmm. we're getting into that in this talk. Um, people's behavior, when it comes to healthcare, is um, sort of largely governed by what's convenient, mm -hmm. and uh, largely governed by the knowledge that they get. And in systems like this, we're beginning to explore, well, how do people transmit information? How do people learn? How do they make healthcare decisions? And how do they get information in a way that they can access and make decisions around? And how do they spread information, right? And so the agent-based platform that we're developing, you can actually look at both things. Uh, what is the uh, most likely way that people will receive information? And what's the most uh, uh, effective way that they will disseminate that information in their network? Mm -hmm. So now you can begin to test behaviors of how they uh, take healthcare information and how they apply it and how they share that information. There is a school of policy extremely fashionable at the moment, which encourages policymakers to nudge um, uh, sound behavior, healthy behavior, through a series of cues. Cass Sunstein was um, President Obama's chief nudger. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the nudge laboratory has been so successful that it's being spun out yeah. as a private organization. Yeah. Um, do you think human beings really are that amenable to being nudged? You're an economist. We I know that uh, decisions become less efficient on a curve the farther out they are. Can you nudge anyone to make a good decision? You absolutely can. Uh, mm -hmm. In our cafeteria, we subsidize the cost of salad, and, and yeah. people start buying salad, right? Yeah. And so there's many ways that you can nudge people. I think uh, uh, positive nudges are better than penalties, and you can test it in systems like this. Was GE involved in the, was it consulted in the creation of the American Care Act? I know a lot of uh, companies were. Yeah. yeah. Were, you, were you involved in the, in the 
description of some of its regulatory principles? Uh, so I, I was not. Yeah. And, you know, so our, our position on, on that is simply that we are working with our customers, the providers, and, and trying to understand and anticipate the changes that that law will bring. Um, right. But I think this begins to sort of test our notion of mm. well, how, did, how do policies develop and how can we get more people participating in understanding mm. these policies and having a voice in understanding the data. But, you know, it's all about focusing on the data. If we get more people to roll up their sleeves and work with the data themselves, you know, I think that's a way that we can get broader participation. Let me ask the question in a more abstracted and less um, provocative way. Tim O'Reilly, um, the Silicon Valley publisher, has called this type of nudging uh, algorithmical regulation. Uh, and he suggested for all its wonderful opportunities, it takes the, the messiness, the conversation uh, out of optimizing our behavior. Rather than having the information that we want and debating in a public sphere, we're kind of invisibly nudged yeah. to, to make decisions. Yeah. As a policy wonk and as an economist, yeah. do you agree with that assessment? Well, what I would say is nudging and the concept of nudging is, is great to test with assumptions in mm -hmm. these kind of environments. So I don't think we will give you the right answer. Like right. What, is, what nudge is the most effective to change mm. health behavior? But I think we can say, look, here are the, the most provocative assumptions. If we assume this about how people behave, we can give you, for example, three different scenarios of Mm -hmm. you know, what are the things we have to get more information about if we're going to test a nudge concept mm -hmm. in, in the real world? You know, all this is about the design phase. We still need to implement ideas in the real world, mm -hmm. collect data, right? But this is more about that design phase and seeing what is the most robust way to test anything, including a nudge, right? Mm -hmm. To improve on a metric that matters. Yeah. Mitch, thank you very much. I'll have thank you back you, on stage in one second. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.